Welcome back to the Mining Pod. On today's show, we're going off-road to an adjacent subject, decentralized storage. We're joined by Bill Schrenkenstein, an engineer at Protocol Labs focused on the Filecoin ecosystem. Filecoin is a decentralized cloud computing model similar to AWS. We talk about the actors, the economics, and how it compares to Bitcoin mining. Bill, welcome to the Mining Pod. You are in unfamiliar territory, or maybe our listeners are in unfamiliar territory. We're going to talk about Filecoin today, an IPFS ecosystem at large, the, the larger world of decentralized storage. Really excited for today's conversation. This is a, a landscape I used to pay attention more to, but I have not over the last two or three years as I've been very immersed, immersed I should say, in Bitcoin mining. Uh, but again, really excited for this conversation and excited to dive into all the info you have for us. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Cool. So we'll start off, just get like a quick bio on you. Uh, we don't spend too much time on the subject because there's lots of ground to cover. We definitely want to hear a little bit about yourself. Uh, you've been doing work as a software developer for years now. And then recently you've been really uh, working with the Filecoin system and IPFS and all those networks. So I'll hand it over to you for a quick bio. Thanks. Um, I started, I, I did, I started as a developer out of college back in 2000. I um, spent 13 years uh, as a defense contractor, as a software developer, sysadmin, project lead. Really loved it um, when you're when you're building weapon systems, right? What could go wrong? Uh, it was cool. But I, I decided um, to, to kind of move into the private sector. And during my last year at Lockheed, I started getting into storage. Um, was building a high-performance recording platform for flight simulation. I thought, you know, this is actually a a really interesting topic. Uh, storage, for, for most people, it's move file from point A to point B, but it, it, it is a lot more than that. And it really enabled me to, to kind of learn a new skill. And one of the things that um, I had noticed just in, in reading was the enterprises anticipate a, a lack of storage talent. The the storage administrator, you know, traditionally is, is kind of dying on the vine. They, they expect by 2025 to have roughly half of what is needed to support private enterprise. And it caused this proliferation of people moving to the cloud, right? They started looking at Amazon and Google and, you know, you have Microsoft Azure and it, it helps to align strategically an enterprise with that talent gap. If I don't have guys that can do storage or do compute and I have the budget, I can shift to OpEx and, and move everything to the cloud and it solves a lot of problems. Um, and really one of the reasons that I that I came to Filecoin was the idea that we're, we're building this network with all of these small storage businesses that are going to be tremendous gap fillers, specifically in areas like archival of research data, media and entertainment, even life sciences and, and things like genomic data. And I, I saw a huge opportunity. And I, I found the concept very interesting because traditionally whether it's cloud storage and I'm region locked or I'm an enterprise and I have on-prem, I'm stuck within the confines of my data center and someone comes along and says, hey, we're building this really cool decentralized network and you can take a file and replicate it six times across the world and support things like access to, to data through locality and durability and accessibility. And it was a really cool story. And um, I had a colleague here that I've worked with uh, at a couple different stops whom I trust and said, you, you've got to take a look at this. And and at that point, I was kind of hooked, right? So I came over and, and started as a solutions architect here, working a lot with what we call storage providers, which are our, our many participants within the network and all, all with other vendors. And I've since moved into uh, engineering management over here where we're building out software solutions really as enablers for people to, to better leverage the network. And it, it's been one heck of a ride so far. There's a lot of talent and a lot of energy in, in the ecosystem and a lot of great tooling that I think will make this a viable solution uh, downstream for people looking to store data very cost effectively, durably, excessively, and safely. So I think ultimately, you know, it, it just kind of aligned with where I was in my career and, and thought, you know, why not? And crypto is a big thing now, right? Everyone's talking Web3 and crypto. And I, I think sometimes we get lost in what the platform truly delivers, which is really the design is this robust global storage service that will allow people to participate in really a storage economy. One of the things that, that folks lose sight of when, when you have data, your data has value, believe it or not, you know, whether it's media archives or, or genomic research data or whatever it is you want to call it, 
there's really an emphasis on the fact in the network that data has value and some of our programs reflect that. And a lot of times, you know, your data is so valuable, you'll put it on Amazon and you've got to pay a boatload just to get it all back, right? Um, they, they understand the same concept, but here we're saying, bring your data to the network, we'll reward you for it, and we're, we're giving you capacity at a fraction of the cost of, of a traditional public cloud target. Love it. Thanks for that that breakdown. Let's go into the taxonomy for those of us who are not super familiar with the Filecoin ecosystem, including like the foundations, the different network participants, and going down through like the structure of uh, the network itself. Because there's definitely a lot of moving parts here that we're not going to be familiar with. And then from there, let's branch into the economics of it, because I think that's something that our listeners are going to be like keen on understanding is like, basically, how do I make money from this thing? Or how does it meet the needs for my workplace or the needs for myself? But to you first, some, some definitions on the Filecoin ecosystem. Okay. Uh, so some high level definitions. Uh, we've already kind of covered storage provider, right? So that's someone who is standing up equipment. They're putting in a Filecoin pledge. They're essentially putting up capacity to the network so people can store data. So that's one of our stakeholders. We have uh, the concept of, of notaries in the network. So one of, uh, one of the examples of the program we have, we, we call it Filecoin Plus. If you had a vault of research data that you wanted to preserve, you could actually apply for the Filecoin Plus program. And if your data is found to be viable for the program, right? Because what we don't want is people storing bad data or having bad actors participate on the network. So you do a KYC, it gets evaluated. If if that, that is granted, then you can work with storage providers to store your data at little to zero cost because of the incentives built into the program. You also have obviously the end users, right? The folks bringing in the data to the network, working with the notaries to get those applications approved, get the data onto the network. And obviously you have the teams at Protocol Labs. We have Filecoin Foundation. We also have a lot of third-party participants uh, in the ecosystem, which really speak to how big it's gotten. We have direct partnerships with Seagate and AMD. We also have uh, software vendors like SendData that are producing solutions to allow users with more traditional Web2 technologies to leverage what we're doing at Filecoin. There's thousands, also thousands of active developers that participate in the network. We have hackathons, we do a lot of university engagement, and we're finding that to be very strong in response. As a matter of fact, that there was just a hackathon at Stanford. They, uh, one of the students built an encryption solution or designed an encryption solution to use parts of the Filecoin network, right? And a, and a product that we call Estuary, which essentially is a, a fast track way to get your data onto the network uh, easily without having to understand how to make things like deals where I have Phil and I want to go to a provider and say, I'll store this file with you. You pay them in Phil. Estuary mm -hmm. takes that burden off their plate and essentially just gives them a, an HTTP endpoint where they can just store data. So it, it reduces the complexity of, of data storage on Filecoin. So the ecosystem is very robust. It's rather large. Um, every time I turn around, I'm meeting some, someone new in the ecosystem that's producing a product. We have some guys uh, with NCloud over in England producing their own encryption solution. And it's just, it's, it's actually been really exciting to watch all of these splinter businesses kind of nucleating out and producing all of these solutions because ultimately storage is just one aspect of, of really the focus of Falcon. We're also looking at the compute side of it and being able to leverage mm -hmm. with the data, keep it adjacent. So there's a lot of different actors in the network um, that are producing all of these different artifacts to kind of help incentivize and, and monetize the, the protocol. So it's a very interesting and complex ecosystem and to cover all the pieces would, would take us weeks, unfortunately. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We'll get to it, I'm sure, at some point. But let's talk about the incentives there, which you just dropped. Uh, I'm thinking of it this way, like there's this neutral network or a building network at this point, and there's participants who want to store data, and then there's participants who are willing to give up capacity to store that data. And you basically have to have some sort of like monetary transfer between the two parties in a decentralized mm -hmm. way. And that's what Filecoin, Protocol Labs, all, all you guys are building and, and enabling this to occur. Walk me through that a little bit uh, from one side or the other. You can choose uh, if I'm someone who wants to use or bring capacity to the network, what does it look like for me? That's a great question. <clears throat> so there are different actual views into this, right? So the, the first one would be, I'm just Joe user. I have some data. I want to store it. 
I have the option to go out and buy Filecoin and invoke my own deals as a user. And as long as you have SPs and willing to make the deals, you can make them. It's a it's one to one. So as a participant, I I have that ability. Or there are solutions with the network. I've already mentioned Estuary, which is one. I can apply for an API key. I get a terabyte of free storage. I can start uploading data. There's also Web3.storage, NFT.storage. So there are other portals that you can use that leverage what we call our incentive programs. The next step would be as an end user, if you want to participate in an incentive program, it's actually beneficial for you, but it's also beneficial for the SPs. And that's that's twofold. So if you come to the network and say, hey, I've got, let's say I've got this research data I need to store. And you can apply for a, a, a fill plus application. And if it's approved, you have a wallet that's loaded with fill that allows you to make the deals with the SPs and to store all this data. With a verified deal like that, um, your data is seen as more valuable. So the rewards for the SPs that store that data get a 10x reward versus just a straight one-to-one -one deal. There are SPs in our ecosystem that, believe it or not, don't store a lot of data. They're just creating what we call blank or CC sectors, where you're going through the sealing process. We call it sealing, uh, the cryptographic hashing, but they'll go through the sealing process and they're just storing blank sectors and accumulating fill at a one-to-one -one ratio. Whereas if it's a verified deal, it's, it's 10 to one. So the economy is really designed to entice users with data to come to the network and to have the SPs be enticed to take those deals, store that data. Ultimately, with data storage, obviously we use the blockchain as, as a method by which we can verify the data that is stored on disk. So if an SP is storing your data and they screw up, they have 24 hours to correct it or they get what we call slashed. Slashing means that they have some pledge collateral and they can lose some of that collateral, right? It could get taken because you're not delivering a high quality of service. And in the network, we talk about things like reputation, quality of service, things like that. And that's reflected in the way the protocol operates. So inherently, if I'm an SP, it's, it's important to me to not only have robust storage stood up. I want to have a backup copy. I want to make sure that at all times my storage is healthy and viable because if you've ever worked in, in storage, maintaining storage platforms can be inherently difficult. There's a lot of things that can cause things like data corruption or data loss, and it, it's a hard charter. And a lot of these SPs are building out innovative solutions to kind of enhance that, but also support the, the integrity checking process of the blockchain. So it's a challenge, but a lot of the actors on the network are figuring out new and innovative ways to to better support their end users. Love it. Okay, so that's part of the conversation I want to go into is more about like the economics of it. Uh, I know you work on a lot of the enterprise solutions or you have in the past. Before we go there, I do want to talk about Filecoin or fill the token itself, F-I-L, for those listening. This is a Bitcoin mining podcast, not a Bitcoin Maximalist podcast, but we do have a lot of listeners that who are like, oh, I'm not super sure I want to talk about another token. And, and that's fine. But we do have basic, we basically talk about anything that's proof of work or has a proof of work been to it. And I think Filecoin in some way does because you have to have like this trade-off, right? Like if I want to get Filecoin token, well, I have to put up this this uh, collateral. I have to put up this storage capacity. Um, yes. And that's a type of proof of work as as I like to determine it. From your purview, how do you think about the Filecoin token and how does it work within the system? Like what's the warrant for having Filecoin, the token, interact with all these different participants? It allows you to have essentially, I could almost call it an island economy, right? So the value of the token obviously is going to be more volatile to, to us than, than having fiat and going dollar to dollar, right? Where I might pay $4, let's say a terabyte a month, where maybe in six months, Amazon will reevaluate and say, hey, here's $5 a terabyte. Phil has a, a higher level of volatility. If you've looked at what's happened with the token just the last couple of days, we announced FEM and all of a sudden phew, it takes off, right? But you have to think about Filecoin as, as essentially an island economy, and that's what the SPs are paid in. That's how they maintain operations, pay their employees, cover their operational costs. And one of the benefits of having all these transactions is it helps strengthen the value of the token. So having users using the fill to, to store data and locking up that fill and pledge collateral, even having, we have gas, right? So you have burns. So all of those things kind of play into enhancing the value of the token to the point that 
when you have enough capacity on the network, it will become deflationary, which is extremely beneficial for, for a cryptocurrency asset. What you're seeing right now is, is a network that's growing at a very rapid pace. If you look at decentralized solutions and the ones we compete against, Store JR, we've one of our engineers, just for fun, backed up the entire Arweave chain and stored it on one of our, our little sub-platforms just because he could, right? So you're, you're looking at this behemoth network that is 99% of the central, decentralized capacity globally. And we're, we're very proud of that. And we're growing at leaps and bounds. We now have, I think we're up to 20 Evibytes right now of, of potential capacity on this network, which, you know, Amazon might look at that and go, eh. But when you consider this network and the main net is just a couple years old, that's phenomenal growth. And um, to give an example of, of what we're seeing in this economy, we have uh, storage providers. We, we project that the current SP allotment has spent roughly about two and a half billion on just hardware, right? I'm wow. expecting one billion in growth annually through 2025, i.e. more SPs either expanding or coming online and just buying more and more gear. So there's a significant amount of money invested in the ecosystem and there's significant opportunity in the ecosystem. And uh, it, it's really reflected in the spend that we're seeing by the, the storage providers. Yeah, so let's go into the storage providers here and, and thanks for that, that data there. My understanding of this is like there'd be a lot of enterprise customers or potential enterprise customers. Like everyone in the world is, you know, storing data somewhere. We just don't think about necessarily where it's going. Oftentimes it's going to these big tech companies. Bitcoin and cryptographic systems, or as you should say, crypto asset systems, really are trying to out compete those big entrenched players, those big monopolies from government all the way to big tech. And I see that's how Filecoin kind of fits into this conversation. Who is the customer base that you guys are facing right now? That's sort of the customer that the customer you want to build with you, the customer that you're looking at in five, 10 years, we want this guy to be around. In in five or 10 years, um, the easiest answer for me is everybody, right? But to, to, if, you look at, if you look at where we're playing today, if you look at who we're talking to, it's the research universities, some of the biggest universities in the country we're talking to. Um, I can't rattle them all off until they do a press release, obviously, but your names that you would sit down and go, oh yeah, you know, these guys are at the, the forefront of research and it's it's very exciting. One of our, our Blue Bell customers we talk about all the time is Stanford. I can talk about them. They have Starling Lab, store all the Shoah data, which is essentially a, a media and entertainment archive of Holocaust survivors to mm. talk about the Holocaust. This is data that, maybe might not to you or I have significant monetary value, but there's a significant value in the historical artifacts that, that need to be stored and preserved. And the network allows them to do so without in, without suffering a significant cost burden because of programs like Phil Plus. A lot of these research institutions will fill it out. And because the SPs are given 10x reward on the data, they don't charge anything to store that data. Some will charge a small fee, fee off to the side but what I can tell you is it's going to be a fraction of anything you'll pay in the public cloud. So really, you want to say everyone, and it's it's a nice story, but we're really looking at research archives, media and entertainment archives, things like genomic archives. They're all going to need to be preserved for historical purposes, and sometimes those things get lost. And if I can go to a, a public broadcast syndicate like PBS and say, hey, you can archive your data for us for free, you already know that they, they operate on low margin. They don't have a ton of cash. We're an ideal solution for that. And in the end, we're preserving data for, you know, mankind uh, for the long term. So I, I've worked with genomics firms where they were they were actually generating so much genomic data, they were actually deleting data. They couldn't afford to store it all. Well, now I could come up with a platform, this, this giant storage platform in this huge bucket and say, hey, but we'll store that for you for free. Just stick it over, encrypt it, stick it over here, and we'll, we'll hold on to it for you. And just in case you need it later, don't delete it. Come get it from us. And, and really, it's it's a great story. Even for enterprises that may say, hey, I've got all this data. It's it's of significant value. They can store a copy with us. If, if you're able to store yeah. data at zero cost, why would I not want an archived copy somewhere that I could go get in, in the event I have uh, force majeure or something along those lines, right? The the one thing that gets lost in all of it is we as a we as a protocol, we are natively immutable. And one of the things that you're probably seeing anybody who follows IT, right? The the big thing with ransomware attacks, 
right? Data gets encrypted. I go to get it. It's not right. Having verified immutable storage, which is what Filecoin delivers natively, is extremely important because I'm going to go and ask for a piece of data based on content. I'm going to get that data back. And it's the data that I know I stored. And we have the blockchain as, as a, a type of audit mechanism so we can see who stored what, when, and where. And and those things are, are extremely advantageous for people who are worried about research integrity and, and data integrity. Yeah, just a little commentary here before I go on to the, the next question. It's interesting that we're having this conversation right now while Bitcoin is having this ordinals moment where a lot of people are using uh, the data discount within Bitcoin that came around from the Taproot upgrade to store JPEGs in Bitcoin. And a small amount of data, and it's making a lot of people upset that people are doing it, but it is permissionless use of data on a blockchain will be there forever. Obviously, it's not much data, so it's not really comparable to Filecoin, but uh, I think it does show that, you know, there's an interest in people having the data stored somewhere that's going to be around in five, 10 years and no one can tamper with it. I want to ask a little bit about like how to get into this ecosystem. So if like I want to be a Filecoin storage provider, which I think if anyone's a miner uh, miner out there, that might be like the interest, right? Uh, they want to yep. get more into proof of work systems. They want to get more into different systems that allow them to do uh, some trade off in order to get a token or get Bitcoin. What would you suggest to do to them uh, for them to do? Yeah, that's a great question. If I ever want to be a storage provider, uh, there's actually uh, a website. Uh, it's web3espa.io. If I recall, let me double check that URL very quickly. I want to make sure I'm not losing my mind. But the no what it is, is, is it's an accelerator program. And it allows you to literally go and learn about what it means to be a provider. Uh, some people have this idea that it's like mining Bitcoin. It is nothing like mining Bitcoin. We have what's called proof of replication and proof of space. Mm -hmm. And... This is really fundamentally at the core of the protocol. So proof of replication means I've taken that file that you gave to me as an SP and I've been able to put it through the sealing process. It's been verified. It's on chain. The The proof of space is, is in turn the, the distribution of the copies and the storage of the copies with yourself and, and your other providers. Having storage knowledge, having core Linux knowledge, understanding how to build a business, these are all things that will be critical. We're actually in the process of building what we call the Filecoin 0 to 100. There's going to be a website. I've already put together a deck and, and a couple of the essays are also working on a deck to essentially show you what type of knowledge you need. Uh, also, your capital requirements, right? So one of the things we've already talked about is in Filecoin, you have the idea of verified deals and 10x reward. Well, for that 10x reward, you also have to have 10x the collateral to pledge. So this network is not unlike some of the others that you might see with like, uh, for example, Flux, right? I go out and buy some mm -hmm. Flux tokens. If I want to provision Flux Compute, I need to pledge Flux tokens. Filecoin gives you that same feeling. Those tokens get locked up. And if I'm going to store, let's say, a petabyte of verified data, I'm roughly looking at 60,000 Filecoin that have to be locked up. And it's, it's actually great. You're taking the tokens out of circulation. They're not going anywhere. That's one of the other driving factors about putting data on this network because if I can lock up the tokens, take them out of circulation, I'm having all these transactions and I'm having burn and I'm literally helping enhance the the, the entirety of the Filecoin uh, economy and ecosystem. So we, we ourselves have our own guidelines, capacity benchmarks we're working to, i.e. we want to onboard X number of, let's say, exabytes this year, for example, that we know will help us get the fill token where we where we all want it to be, right? Obviously, when you're in crypto, watching that big green candle go up, up, up is always exciting, right? And we just had a major announcement and you, you just saw the impact and we're, we're really scratching the surface of, of what PL is doing and what Filecoin is doing. We're, we're addressing the side. Uh, we just had an announcement about a partnership with Lockheed. I don't know if you saw that in IPFS. So there's a lot of exciting things going on in our ecosystem that that give a lot of our users um, not only confidence, but hope that uh, this economy will continue to thrive. So I want to go back to the last uh, phrase you said there, that it's not very similar to Bitcoin mining. And I think that's an interesting place to kind of leave the discussion here. When I come from like a, a Bitcoin perspective and see some of these other networks that do cost to use them, right? Cost to be on the storage side or cost to use on the, on the user side. 
I think it's like similar in the sense that like for Bitcoin mining, I have to put up an operational cost. I have to pay those costs monthly. Uh, I get rewarded in a token Bitcoin, and then I can use that Bitcoin for wherever I want. I can liquidate it to USD. I can go buy another token. I can go leave it in Bitcoin. Uh, similarities there are like somewhat there on the business side, but you're sort of refuting that. So I want to get some thoughts on why that is. I, I wouldn't say we're. I'm I'm necessarily refuting it. It's it is a different method of operation, right? But what we're we're really yeah. showing is the utility of the token. And and this is the one thing that I used to get wrapped up in when I first started getting into crypto back in in I want to say 2016, 17, right? They were talking about does the token have a real utility, right? Yeah. Bitcoin, it's a store of value. I can liquidate it and to your point. I can buy things with fiat. I can even use Bitcoin to buy things if I want through certain websites, right? There are partners that have a Bitcoin portal and I, I can buy this. Filecoin isn't that much different in a sense that I have data that has value. I have a token that has value. I'm using that token to essentially store the data. I could use it to retrieve data um, depending on on what type of tiering I set up. There's a, a different... It's, it's kind of a different use case, right, where it's mapped to storage, whereas some of these other tokens, it's it's mainly just I'm, I'm mapped to a fiat. I don't have a purpose other than yeah. a buy, sell, make money. Filecoin really has a true utility, and I, I think that's where it differs from a lot of the other tokens that are out there, right? People will look at look at the, the rise of meme tokens and, and how that's kind of come about. I, I see Filecoin as completely different because I, I can actually do something with it, right? I could... I could literally go and buy a 500 file coin right now and make deals and, and store whatever data I want with whatever SP I wish and, and have that data there through the duration of what we call a deal. So I might say, mm -hmm. hey, here's 0.01 fill, hold this file for 18 months. To, to hold a file at, at literally a fraction of a fill when I'm paying, let's say, I don't know, $10 a terabyte for a public cloud service, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Because you're, you're talking about yeah. spending you know, eight, nine, 10 cents to store a file for 18 months, where it's like, I'm, I'm paying gobs of money per terabyte uh, for a public cloud service. So I think each token has to be evaluated on its own merit. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Some tokens claim to have use, they don't. Some don't do a very good job of, of highlighting their use, where they, they have real value, but people can't really articulate or understand what the token does, and it, it kind of gets shortfalled. But... Um, I, I think it's it's your miles may vary based on experience and based on token. Gotcha. Love that answer. I, I definitely agree. Uh, every token has different utility. Um, and yeah, there's there's different use cases for everything. Bill, I want to thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Where can we find your work or your Twitter or wherever you publish your stuff? You can find me at uh, Dr. Shrek 77, D-R-S-C-H-R-E-C-K 77 on Twitter. Um We'll be posting a lot more there. Uh, we also have sub accounts on Twitter. So you have folks that have, there's uh, one around being an SP for Filecoin. There's one around, uh, you, you know, client type data activity. And we all tweet them out. Estuary has its own. So you can learn about us just following some of us on Twitter, seeing who we're linked to. And you can kind of bounce around and see all the players in the ecosystem. And it, and it makes for, for one heck of a ride. But you can look me up there on Twitter. You can look me up on LinkedIn. And I highly recommend for anybody looking to become an SP, there's sp.filecoin.io, the website, and filecoin.io, the website, is is our main page. Go there and check things out. Uh, surf around. And we have, uh, you can get access to Slack, and you'll find a lot of us there, including myself. And you can jump right on Slack and chat with us in real time. Love it. Bill, thank you again so much. Hopefully talk again with you soon. Yep, sounds great, and, and thank you for your time. You take care.